All right, um, we're gonna get started. So my name is Luther Hill. Uh, I'm a solutions architect with Fishtown Analytics. Uh, the company's based out of Philadelphia, but I am actually, um, I'm actually, I actually live in Louisville right now, uh, Louisville. So right off of uh, Shelby Park in like the Germantown area, really cool. Um, and then this whole presentation came about because one, my kids were home for the summer and then they wanted something to do. You know, it's <laughs> like many great things. Uh, kids are home for the summer, wanted some stuff to do. Um, and then I also realized that last year I had gone to like a bunch of tech conferences and I had a bunch of like extra stuff. You know, I had like these AWS credits, I had some Microsoft credits, um, I had a Raspberry Pi. I had like a, you know, I had like a fifty dollar Amazon gift card somehow, um, you know. So I just had like this random assortment of stuff. Uh, and then my daughter at the time was really into birds. She was up here visiting for the summer and living right next to Shelby Park. Um, there's quite a lot of birds here. I didn't know how many till I started this project. So there's a lot of birds, and then that led into you know her asking me constantly, Dad, what? Your video cut out on my end. Michael, do you see him? Nope. I don't know. I thought it was me for a minute. Give him a second. This is always my worst fear when I'm presenting in a remote event. <laughs> right here. Yeah, that happens. Probably had to like restart his computer or something. Yeah. So it takes a few minutes. Right, give yeah, him a couple there. minutes. Yep. Last year at Code Palooza, I mistakenly didn't plug my laptop in during a presentation and it just shut down. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, sometimes you don't even notice that. Uh huh. <laughs> I think those are the things I'm OCD about. <laughs> A little too much.
The recording of this is just going to be 10 minutes of me and you staring at each other. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> Ten minutes. Cool. Thank you. I don't know if he's... Internet might be out of his place or something. He can't connect back on. I was, I was in a conference the first half of this week. And the uh, power went off in their entire city. Can't make that up. <laughs> nope. Dang.
Okay, is everybody still there? We are. Oh, we're man. We're waiting for you. <sighs> you know what? <laughs> <laughs> the you joy is remote, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, we got a new puppy, and I, <laughs> I, I never thought I had to use the excuse that dog ate my homework. But the dog ate my cable. <laughs> oh man! I'm, I'm talking, and then the thing just cuts out. I'm like, "What is going on here?" The internet went out, and then I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I first should go downstairs, and I'm like looking, and I'm trying to figure out what the heck is going on, and then I'm looking at the cable, and there's a big old dog chew on the cable, and I'm like, "Oh, God. yeah," you know, so. <laughs> That's a first for me. That's that's fantastic. I know, man. I know. <laughs> I know, right? I, I mean, like, I, yeah. I really, I never thought I'd really <laughs> ever say that, but <laughs> I'll get my cable. So. <laughs> nice. Uh, all right. So let's get back on it, man. Um, cool. So anyway, you know, I was with the kids, and you know, I had a bunch of extra tech stuff from all these conferences. And I had, um, I don't know, I, I just wanted to do something cool because I figure like, why not, right? Why not do something cool? You go to all these conferences, you get all this stuff, and then it's, you know, what are you going to do with it? Um, so I found out a couple of things. One, I found out that 95% of all bird species are pretty much categorized. So like, there's a very high rate of like people, somebody knows what this bird is. Uh, there, you know, there's over 9,000 or really over nine to 10,000 species of birds, which is a lot of birds. And which explains why every time my daughter asked me what bird that was, I had no clue. I pretty much resorted to like, it's a red bird, it's a blue bird, or it's a brown bird. One of the three. And I was, you know, that's kind of what I stuck with. Um, so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to like get a better handle on it, right? So that's why I chose the topic. My daughter was looking at birds and I thought it was pretty cool. And I wanted, you know, I'm always trying to encourage my kids to get into tech and technology. So I figured this would be a great way of like, hey, you like birds? Technology can help us solve this problem. And at the same time, I also wanted to, I really wanted to do something that was like at a global scale, you know? Because I think often, you know, we do this project at the house and it ends up becoming like, you know, I have this Raspberry Pi server who does my local weather data and like, that's it. Um, but I really wanted to try is like how if I wanted to scale this up, like how would I scale this? Uh, so that led me down to this thing, which is like, what bird is this? Um, you know, it was a typical question. And I once again had no clue. But Microsoft, surprisingly. Uh, they did not have an answer, but they had a really cool piece of inspiration that I used to get the answer, right? Okay, here we go. That's what I'm looking for. Anybody ever seen this video? As the apex predator of the mountains of Central and South Asia, their presence or absence of snow leopards indicates a false well ecosystem. So by using cameras to study the snow leopard population, we are actually working to protect an entire ecosystem. The problem is the only way to really know how many snow leopards are there is to be able to do more and more camera surveys. And analyzing all those images used to take up a considerable chunk of our time. Now, Microsoft AI is scanning through hundreds of thousands of images and looking for those features that make a snow leopard a snow leopard. And then separating those images which have snow leopards from those that do not spend 10 minutes instead of 10 days. I don't think you can overemphasize the value of time by automatically analyzing these images and creating a database for us. Microsoft AI is providing our small team with the time to do more surveys and collect better data so we can better understand the health of this ecosystem. And that to me is a very exciting part. Right? Like, that's a pretty cool video. Like, I was like, man, I like, I want to do that. You know, I'm like building one bird feeder and everything. That's not enough, man. Like, I, <laughs> like, I want to help save the snow leopards or something. Um, you know, so what I did basically is I initially started some research. 
I started looking at the birds in my own backyard, right? Um, and that led to a realization that there was over 20 different species of birds in my own backyard. Yeah, I live next to a park. So it kind of like, you know, it, it kind of helps. I mean, there was like a, a falcon. There was obviously the red bird, blue bird um, combination. But there was all this just like different kinds of birds that were out there that I, I had no clue about. Um, so it was very interesting to first see that. And then the next thing I wanted to figure out is what kind of technology would I need to make this happen? Turns out you can buy all the stuff on Amazon. Amazon has like a great, a Raspberry Pi will cost you 35 bucks. You know, um, a Raspberry Pi camera will, you can get one for less than 20 bucks. Uh, a bird feeder, I built one with the kids um, from a Lowe's kit and that cost me 10 bucks. But if you wanted to build, if you wanted to buy an actual bird feeder, you know, you could get one for under 30 bucks. Uh, and then another thing I've found very useful is some form of lighting system. Because turns out if you have the camera inside the bird feeder, it's very dark in there, which means that you can't see the birds. So, you know, some form of lighting system. Uh, and the other thing I realized I needed, that I needed uh, two data engineering problems cropped up, which is one, how do you get the data from the device? So really, once I decided that it's not just going to be me and my kids doing this in our backyard, it became, OK, how do I move the data around to analyze it? Um, one, I found out you needed a reliable, some kind of reliable connective, connective system. So the Raspberry Pi in my house was obviously Wi-Fi. I put it under Wi-Fi, which was great. Uh, for data engineering purposes, I try to process as much of the data locally as I could. So Raspberry Pi is a good system for that, right? It has an onboard computer. It can do some initial, is this a bird, is this not a bird kind of branching, which is useful because turns out squirrels also trigger your system. Um, <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of squirrels being next to a park, right? They also want some food. So you have to be able to just like send the system just birds. Uh, so that's your first problem. You have to like have some form of way of like, I just want the birds, any kind of bird. Uh, the other thing um, we'll take a look at is actually if you go back to this picture, right? So you would think that this kind of picture is like, it took me a while to realize that my uh, model and my camera needed a very specific profile of the bird to work. So meaning that a side profile is different than a front profile. Um, a side profile at night is different than a side profile during the daytime. So you really have to think about your, it's like any other data problem, right? They think about your, um, your data dimensions, like what kind of dimensions do you want for your data? Like how do you structure your data so you can get the most out of it? And for me, I found the best way to structure my data is to get a full side view of the bird because it allowed me to get the most features out of that animal, right? I can see the feet, I can see the breast color, I can see the wings, I can see the beak, you can see the eyes. You can even, if you wanted to, uh, which I, I want to work on is like measure the bird, right? From like, you know, width and height, you can do a measurement of the bird. So it's all kind of data that you can get out of just this one side profile, which means that I had to set up my bird box in a very specific way. Uh, and also my camera inside of it, you know, I put it on the side in a very specific way to get that picture, get that data I needed out of it. That's kind of like my hypothesis, just using like I talked about really easy, accessible technology to scale out bird recognition, right? I had way too much time on my hands. I had way too much free technology and I wanted to do something with it. Um, we already did that. So testing method is one, I needed the birds, I needed the system to be reliable because like you saw in that, um, in that video with the, the snow leopards, you realize that the birds are not all, whatever data you're trying to get from this device, 
it's not always going to be in like the most pristine of environments, right? So you're going to have environments where you have limited connectivity. So how do you solve for that data problem? The way I solved for it was uh, as a trial run, I put it in this park, which was like about 30 minutes away from me. Obviously, it didn't have Wi-Fi, you know, so I couldn't connect to it. But what I did is I, I did a basic Python uh, script, which was if there's no Wi-Fi, save it to the local system, right? So I saved it on the on the little SD card, uh, and then when I had it at my house, if it was connected to Wi-Fi, it would just send it over over the system directly to my data, to my S3 bucket, which is why I stored everything. So you have to you have to kind of think about those things, like how do I get this data out of the device? Um, the other thing for just the machine learning part is I wanted a really solid probability of the of the bird. So I wanted a 90% plus probability that it was correct because turns out a lot of birds look like each other. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of red birds and a lot of blue birds. Um, so which I found from my testing that if you get like a front view of the bird, it's really hard to tell what bird that is because you know you don't have you don't have a lot of information to go off of um so that's why the side profile you know i needed uh i had to put like a little flash in the bird feeder because i realized that you know birds birds are nocturnal creatures come to find out or at least they feed nocturnally so a lot of times they'd be in there feeding and then i'd, I'd have this like completely dark picture of them like i can't do anything with that uh, so I got like a nice little flash and, you know, of course it would scare the birds away after they ate, but you know, whatever, uh, they can deal with it. So the other thing I wanted to think about is, okay, so I have the data on the system or I moved it out of my, uh, out of the system into an S3 bucket. However, I've done that. I use S3 AWS as a kind of like storage backbone of it, mostly because, you know, it's basically free. I mean, it's infinitely scalable. It's free. You know, it's easy breezy. Uh, so I realized one that I needed some kind of central database of it because S3 was a logical choice because of a couple of reasons. One, the system, the IoT device could be at my house. It could be um, somewhere else in a park, or it could be at a friend's house where I can connect to their Wi-Fi. So I needed a way to like reliably store all of that data ingested into one central system that I could then query against and like run analysis and everything else. Um, so S3 kind of fit the bill for that. This is like a basic, a basic sketch of the kind of system that I built. Uh, the AWS Deep Lens is actually really cool, but also very expensive. So I recommend you don't do that. A Raspberry Pi with a camera, 50 bucks, you're done. You're good to go. So the other thing that comes into play if you look at this is, okay, so you have your data. You somehow moved it to like an S3 bucket somewhere in the cloud or, or whatever thing, right? Uh, you've maybe done some basic processing on the data at the local point, you know, at the local device. And then you're thinking, okay, well, how do I then analyze it, right? Because the picture is not, and it's not that useful for, it's not that useful for me because once again, red bird, blue bird, brown bird, that's the only thing I can tell from the thing. Um, you know, so what I did is I, I trained a quick model in Amazon SageMaker and I linked it to that S3 bucket and I had a Lambda job going for every time a new picture was placed in that S3 bucket, it would fire up a Lambda job. And then the S3, um, yeah, the Sage Amazon SageMaker would run the prediction model against that picture and then give me back like some kind of result. Usually, you know, like a, Amazon does not like a JSON string, which was good. I put a couple of parameters and I wanted on there like, uh, obviously, what kind of bird it thought it was and the probability of, of that prediction, uh, what color it was, I mean, which is, you know, you would think that it's um, it's non-trivial to say, oh, okay, what color is this bird? But turns out it's harder than you think because, one, 
birds are not just red or blue or brown. They can be red and blue and brown. They can be yellow. So, you know, it's kind of, at, at first I, re, I was like, oh, I only need two parameters. Like, it's only going to be one of three colors. But then you realize like, oh, no, that's, you know, there's a lot of different colors that the bird could be. Um, so when I built out my, uh, my database, I consolidated all the files that JSON string would feed into like a central kind of like um, database. And then I, I kept having to add columns because looking at the database, like every bird was the same, you know, like red bird, brown bird, you know, it wasn't that useful. Uh, one column I did add, but I'm still working on, is the height and width column, which is really useful, come to find out, for actual bird watchers. Because if you have that information, let's say the, the algorithm runs a prediction, it's this kind of bird with this color scheme. Um, you can find out a, the approximate age of the bird if you have the height and the width of the bird. Because it's like a kid, you know, they grow in a very linear fashion. So depending on where they are in that scale, you can say, okay, this bird is X years old. Um, you can even see how healthy they are from, uh, from looking at that height and width. And then also looking at the picture too. At first I was not saving the pictures. I would basically, as soon as um, the model, as soon as the Amazon SageMaker kicked up the job with uh, Lambda, it would run the prediction it would give me a JSON string. I would save that to like a CSV file or something. And then I would delete the picture thinking that, you know, I'm saving storage. I'm not paying for anything I don't need, you know, all those different things. But after talking to a friend of mine who was really into birds, like the guy is really into birds, found out that it would be more useful if in addition to all those dimensions about the bird, you know, like what kind of bird, I thought it was the probability, height, weight, color scheme. Uh, I he would also like really like the picture of the bird because then you could do independent validation of your data, right? So that's the other thing. The thing about data engineering is like, how do you expose the actual primitive data to a user? Um, and some you know, for me for this particular instance, I just made the bucket uh, public, and I just every on the JSON string. Every uh, there was a column with the link to the to the bucket. So whenever you got it, you just clicked on it. It would take you directly to the S3 bucket location for the bird, and you know he could watch it to its heart content about like what bird or do some independent validation on there. Um, and then another thing I kind of found useful. Well, it wasn't useful for me because I didn't have enough birds. But one thing I found that was useful, if you're really thinking about scaling out globally, is to have a folder for each species of bird. Uh, and you can do, you can automate this through Lambda because you can either, the initial thought was to create a bucket for each bird that I had because, you know, you get the, hey, you get the prediction, I think it's this kind of bird. But what I realized is that if you're going to scale it out globally, then you have to think about what if I don't, you know, hard, what if I don't know at the beginning what kind of bird I'm going to get? So then it turns into, okay, well, the system will know, will make a prediction of the bird. I will use that to label the folder. So it became like, if, you know, it's any one of these we've seen, any of these species we've seen before, they go into this species folder. If it's not something we've seen before, then we create a folder um, to keep keep separate, right? The other thing that I ran into, which is I found out I, that my model is not very accurate. So there's a lot of like, um, and also because I had a very high threshold for uh, what data I wanted kept, I realized that it was kicking out. 90% is a very high threshold. Uh, so I found out that it was it was disregarding or deleting a lot of other pictures of other birds. Maybe, you know, the it, it didn't get a, a nice side view. The lighting wasn't correct. Um, the bird, a lot of times I found out the birds would get in there and like they would jostle things around. So it might be a little bit blurry or something like that. Um, so what I did, I created a folder with like anything that wasn't recognized. I stuck it in its own folder and said, you know what? I'm just gonna leave it here. 
And I also linked that into a column. I just labeled it as unknown. So uh, unknown, and in that way, anybody, or really just me and my friend who wanted to take a look at it could go in there and say, oh, this bird is unknown, and then you could label it additionally or different things. Um, and what I really liked about this whole setup is that it taught me a lot about how to think about moving data around, you know, and what is useful. It made me realize that if you're thinking about scale, and this is why I really wanted to get out of this presentation. If you're thinking about scaling something, you have to think about what is the, you know, what is the end use for this data? But at the same time, how do I build in flexibility so that I can use it in different ways in the future? Um, which is always tricky, right? Because you have to balance the need for, I don't wanna, you know, obviously this bird thing is a simple example, but if you're storing petabytes, you know, terabytes of data, you can't store everything. You have to make a choice at some point, what you keep, what you don't keep uh, based on the analysis that you wanna run. Um, and you know that's kind of like an individual choice. But what I found, I mean, my my learning from this is that S three is dirt cheap, like dirt, dirt, dirt cheap. I mean, even images that are of um, you know higher quality, a larger file storage size, even those things are dirt cheap on S three. So I took a more data lake approach to S3, which is anything and everything I captured, blurry images, I didn't care, whatever it was, I just kind of stuck it in S3. And then from there, I would process it with uh, Amazon SageMaker, kick up a Lambda job for every new image that came in, process it. And then from there, I would separate it into like specific buckets based on species and also based on unknown, right? If I if I just didn't know what it was. Um, and even that duplication of data was still useful because once again, S3 is like dirt cheap. So I was able to really store all of my images and, and really get a good idea of what was going on there. So that's why I found out my my park in the back, of the literally the back of my house has 20 different kinds of birds in it, which is, you know, amazing to me. So it's amazing what you can do when you just start taking a look at what's around you. Um, and then just with that initial package that I built, you know, I have high aspirations for it. Who knows? Um, <laughs> I would really like to, I, you know, as I travel and I, I think as I have friends, I have friends in D.C., I have friends in North Carolina, I have friends all over the place. So I. I think every Christmas I'm just going to give them a gift of a bird feeder and tell them it's Wi-Fi enabled, <laughs> you know, and then just like as the as their birds come in, just kind of do that and like capture some more birds. You know, I think it'd be kind of cool. Um, I don't know. I think it'd be kind of cool. And then this whole thing led me into this rabbit hole of uh, live cameras. So there are live cameras all over the Internet, like pointed at different things right which is also a very cool if you think about it from a scaling perspective also a very cool thing because now you can scale not just like your individual iot device but now you can say okay i'm going to point my uh, model at this this picture right i'm going to take this live stream or whatever it is uh, i found a really cool live stream of um of a bird feeder like somebody just on the internet was live streaming their bird feeder and it was just pointed at 24 seven and you'd see like birds flying in and out, you know, you'd see most of the time it was absolutely nothing, but it was a, it was a great example of if you wanted to kind of scale that up, like how would you think about that? You know, how would you kick off a Lambda job? How would you get that video? Um, how would you process it? What would you store it? What would you do with it? Uh, so, yeah, a couple of discoveries, 20 kinds of birds. This is like a picture of a <laughs> northern car cardinal at 98% you know, thing rate. So it was pretty cool. As you can tell, like you really gotta you really gotta get a good profile of it. It turns out there's 
not all profiles work. Um, a nice side profile in broad daylight is the best, is really the best. Um, and then, you know, my kids really enjoyed it because it got them a chance to do some really cool stuff. You know, they got a chance to work with the Raspberry Pi. Uh, they got a chance to like work with the camera setup. My, da my daughter really enjoyed like set up the tiny camera in the birdhouse. Uh, my son really enjoyed figuring out like the other thing, you know, as far as data goes is you can also, uh, I didn't do this, but I kind of thought about it later is you can say, you can have a column in there for what kind of bird food you have in the bird feeder, because not every bird is attracted to every bird food. So you could, you know, and there's like this whole sub world of what kind of food you should like used to attract what kind of birds like its own reddit thread um you know so that is also like something else you could kind of play around with if you wanted to attract like a certain species of bird you could really set up the feeding system to attract that bird in particular and um and look for it so it's really cool i also found out that serverless architecture is really great for this kind of this kinds of system especially with data engineering process so what happens is that there'll be large segments of time when nothing is happening, like absolutely nothing. There's no bird, there's nothing going on. So at first what I would do is I would have the Raspberry Pi kind of like um, sample it, right? Like sample every, every time, just kind of sample it, sample the camera, sample the camera, which obviously led to a lot of, a lot of pictures, a lot of completely blank walls, a lot of completely, it's horrible pictures. So one thing I added was I went to Amazon and I bought like a small IR triggering system to hook up to the Raspberry Pi. So it would have like an IR light shine on whatever the thing was. And then whatever detected movement, then it would trigger the camera to take a picture, which made more sense if you think about it, right? Because I don't want, you know, if I just randomly sample it, I might miss a bird. But if I just watch for movement, then I'll more than likely capture a bird, or in my case, squirrels. I got a lot of squirrels. Um, so that was also very useful. Maybe I should turn into like a squirrel detection model. Uh, you know, so once, so that, so that was like one little lambda thing I used was like only trigger on events. And then once it was sent into the bucket, same thing with the bucket, right? At first, it would just get a bunch of like random photos because it was constantly sending stuff, uh, and it would constantly process and run up a bill. You know, I tried to do like an EC2 system. And I just realized like I'm running this EC2 thing 24 hours a day. There's like a bunch of worthless pictures. You know, it's just not it's not performant. It's not it doesn't fit. So I really started looking at the Lambda architecture, and I realized that. I could kick off a Lambda job only when pictures came into the system, right? So depending on, you know, depending on whether it was connected to Wi-Fi or if I had to like kind of upload the pictures myself, every time I loaded pictures into that S3 bucket, it would kick off a Lambda job, spin up the SageMaker instance, classify the bird, and then spit it back out into, um, into its separate folders by species or if you know, if I hadn't kind of hard coded the species, it would just stick it unknown or build a new species based on what it thought. Uh, that allowed me to save a lot of money and it allowed me to kind of get a more performance system. But the other thing I realized is that you need to separate your analytical system from your production system. So, I mean, this didn't impact me so much in this particular case because I would just save the JSON string to a CSV file. Um, and just kind of like keep adding to it, like appending to the CSV file, which was fine. But after looking at how you would scale it up, I realized what would happen is that, you know, if you're really thinking about it from a global perspective, you're gonna have a lot of birds at different hours of the day, right? Different hours of the different times. And by locking my, my production system every time that I wanted to update it, I was missing out on, on analytical information I could pull out of it. So what I did is I, I don't know if anybody, anybody's familiar with Snowflake? Anybody heard of Snowflake? Yeah. 
kind of. Okay, so Snowflake is uh, is specifically made for an analytical database. It's uh, it's very performant. It uses S3 as a storage mechanism, and it separates compute and storage. So what I did is I created a database that was based on my uh, S3 bucket of CSV files and images. And then every 24 hours, Snowflake would go back to that bucket. It would update the database and then just display it there. So I was able to use SQL to query that database like any other system, right? I was able to run queries and say, show me all the red birds in this location at this time. Um, you know, so you can, as you scale up, things like that become more necessary because you don't want to have to go back to your production system every time you want to run some analytical query on your information. You want to really separate it. And Snowflake worked for me in this instance because uh, one, the storage was dirt cheap because it's based on S3. So I really paid nothing. And then I only paid when I used compute, which means that I only paid when I did a query. So it was great because there would be large segments of time when guess what? There was no birds being uploaded. There was nothing happening, you know, so there's nothing to query. Uh, so I would only query stuff when, you know, after basically every month I would run a query and see what new birds came in. And usually there was enough. So it helped me, you know, that serverless architecture using a separate system that was very cheap and affordable for analytical uh, purposes really helped. Um, and it was just fun. You know, I got to spend time with the kids. I got to spend time working on some cool tech stuff. I got to learn about Snowflake. I got to really learn about data engineering from a global perspective, because often, you know, we have these very small problems that we solve and it's very like, very niche. This kind of thing, while it's fun, it allows you to think outside of like your local scope and think globally. Like, how would I, how would I scale this up? Like, if I gave my friend a bird box, like, how would I get the pictures back? Where would I store it? How would I query the data? You know, is there a latency requirement? And for me, there was no latency requirement because guess what? If I get the bird pictures two days late, big deal. You know, um, whatever. So, uh, yeah, the, the big takeaway is, you know, find something fun to do. Um, and that was the whole genesis of this presentation. It wasn't to make it like a hardcore data engineering problem. It was just to really say that you can take any kind of problem that you think is fun and interesting and scale it up, you know, like see how far you can really scale it up. Um, for me, that involved like thinking about like, oh, I can give, I can start giving birdhouses as presents now uh, to my friends in different cities and, you know, and seeing how many pictures I can get back. So far, I've done it in one Washington, DC. And that was kind of cool. That was kind of interesting. Um, I got some really cool pictures there. Turns out uh, there's like a lot of, they have very similar birds there. So a lot of birds are regional, uh, which is interesting. Um, and also, you know, then you realize that you start thinking about like seasons, right? Birds travel season to season. So even that was like an interesting thing to see what birds, oh, one season they're here, next season they're over here. Um, all those different interesting data points you can learn. Uh, and also thinking about the scaling factor too. It's like, now that I found all these YouTube feeds or, or website feeds of cameras and everything else, like, how would I scale that up? How would I set up my infrastructure to do it? And the great thing about a lot of this cloud architecture now is that it's, I mean, it's like dirt cheap, you know, it's dirt cheap. There's nothing stopping me from saying, you know what? I'm going to search for every video feed I can find out there in the world. And I'm going to run a Lambda job and query every video feed every 10 minutes to see if there's a bird in it. And every time I see a picture of a bird, I'm going to snap it up from that feed and store it in my S3 bucket and analyze it, right? So those are the cool things that you can do at a global scale that you don't need. You don't need a fancy data set. You know, you don't need fancy tools. You don't need fancy knowledge. You can, you know, it's all things that you can do yourself. Uh, conclusion, I proved that it was affordable to build a pipeline. Uh, affordable for me was key. Uh, because like, you know, 
I got kids, I got bills to pay. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, I, I just, I couldn't spend a whole bunch of money because if you look around, there's like all these um, pre-made kids and that'll do stuff like this for you, but they're all like hundreds of dollars and, and I'm like, no, thank you. Uh, the other thing I found out is that kids are really into birds. Kids really like birds. They love the, you know, um, they just like birds. Uh, there are more birds in your bar backyard than you think. You know, like once again, I was uh, in that mindset of, you know, blue bird, brown bird, red bird, that's it. And then you can really build a world-class system without having lots of money. You don't need lots of money. You just need to think about the problem and find a creative solution to it. Uh, and that could be said for a lot of different data engineering problems you have at work or different things. Um, for me, it was stepping away from that traditional, everything needs to have an EC2 instance dedicated to it. Everything needs to, you know, have some super performance system back in it, you know, uh, EBS storage and like the latest database, you know, that's the way I got into it thinking because that's, you know, the corporate job mentality. Everything needs to be like this really super expensive world-class system. Uh, what I found out is that give me a, a dirt cheap S3 bucket, a, a one or two Lambda jobs, a Raspberry Pi, um, and ability to save to CVS, and I can build a world-class system that's easily accessible to anybody. You know, so it's really cool to think about that and, and come to that realization. Uh, what's next? I'd really like to find some rare species of birds. I feel like that'd be cool. Um, and I think that would be very achievable with the system as it is, because really what makes it hard to find rare birds is if you think about it from a, a, a data perspective, that it's a very seldom, it's a very low probability event. So really what you're doing is that you're, you're watching a lot of time. You're just sitting there 90% of the time, you're just watching, absolutely nothing is gonna happen then 0.5% of the time, something will happen, but it might not really be a rare bird. It'll just be like a common blue jay or sparrow or, or whatever, um, or hawk or eagle, falcon. It turns out there's a falcon in my backyard. I didn't know this, but <laughs> there's a falcon that flies around the park. And I remember seeing this thing and thinking like, what kind of bird is that? Like, I know some kind of hawk or something. Like, what is this? But one day it like, it basically tried to attack some bird that was on my bird feeder and I, and it snapped a picture of it and it turns out it was a falcon. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Um, awesome. So I really like to find like a rare species of bird, maybe put it in like some really cool, interesting place and like find a rare species. That would be, that'd be interesting. Um, I want to create a better front end because I realized that, you know, a, publicly accessible S3 bucket full of, full of images, you know, some CSV files and a Snowflake instance that I'm running SQL against is not, you know, it's kind of cool for me, but it's not exactly scalable for other people, right? Like not everybody has that skill set. Sometimes they just want a nice drop down, show me this bird in this location, you know, whatever it might be. The other thing I'd really like to do is create some kind of publicly accessible database. Uh, and this is like kind of what I've done with the with the S3 bucket with the CSV file. It just appends and keeps writing as birds, you know, come in and the information and everything else. So that's kind of what I've done, but it's, you know, it's not a database. It's just a very, it's just a large text file. Um, so having, you know, an actual database that is, that is, uh, you can query with standard tools. You don't need to download or you don't need to do anything. You know, you can kind of assist, you can operationalize, it would be very cool. And also it would make it easy to find rare birds because the thing about finding rare birds is that the way I've built a system, it only looks for certain birds. So luckily I do the unknown. Like if I don't know what it is or don't have a high probability, I'll just stick it in a random bucket and anybody can look at it. Um, so who knows, there might be a rare bird hanging out in that, right? Um, I don't know. So that's what I'd like to do. The other thing I'd kind of like to do is record the bird sounds 
because after talking to a couple birders, that's what they call birders, who uh, <laughs> realize that when they're out birding, they not only look for the bird, but they also listen for the sound, which I thought was very interesting because, you know, in my mind, it was just about the data point of like, what do you see? Um, so that's something that I'm thinking about, you know, how to implement. Uh, it would basically be like putting a speaker on there, but so far the speakers I've used tend to pick up a lot of like really random noise. So it would have to be something like a, a more, like you could actually aim at a specific spot and same thing, it had to be triggered the same way the camera is triggered, right? It would have to be triggered by some specific action that is being taken place. So that might be really interesting to work up like, you know, my CSV file also linked to the picture, also linked to like a recording of the bird, right? Um, I figure like that'd be really cool. Uh, and then, is this it? Oh, yeah, I guess that's the last thing I'll do. So, but yeah, um, it was a lot of fun. The project was very interesting. It taught me a lot about how to think about uh, not just like, okay, I have data on my computer, but how do I share it with other people? How do I make it accessible? Um, how do I organize the information to make it usable? Um, and also got me thinking about like some, you know, stuff you deal with at work all the time, which is how often do I actually need this data? And turns out I don't need bird data every single second it comes in. Like if, you know, it doesn't matter that it came in at two o'clock in the morning, there's nothing I can really do with it if it comes at two o'clock in the morning. So I don't need to be notified of every bird event, which is originally, you know, I had it set to like a, a Amazon uh, notification service, SNS, set it to like every time it took a picture of the bird or, or whatever, it would like email me and then I get like this alert on my phone. Um, turns out after a couple, two, three o'clock email alerts about squirrels or your bird feeder shaking, you just realize that, you know what? I don't need to know every time you see a bird, like it doesn't matter. I'll check it in the morning. It'll be okay. Um, the other thing you have to think about is like redundancy of your data uh, at every level of the process. One thing I found out is that from sticking my camera in the park uh, is that the, <laughs> the Raspberry Pi is not waterproof. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's not waterproof. And if it gets wet, you lose all your data on there, right? <laughs> so, so that was like, I had to then, you know, waterproof it and, and send it back out there. Uh, and the other thing I had to think of too is like, if you really think about it from a scaling perspective, let's say you're in an area that's really rich with birds, right? you probably should put some kind of compression on the folder, on the file, because if you have a lot of images, especially something like a Raspberry Pi or any kind of IoT device that doesn't have a whole lot of space, it just doesn't, you can't store as many images. So finding either a way to compress the images or also finding um, what kind of uh, settings you need to apply to your camera, right? I found out that I don't need you know 4K pictures I just basically need like your basic 720, you know, DPI or whatever it is, like some real, it could be a little bit grainy, that's fine. For the model, what really matters is that it can make out the colors, it can make out the key features, the head shape, the eyes, the beak, um, you know, like the the feather kind of lay out how the, how the feathers line up. Uh, those things matter, but you know, getting like every speck of the bird perfectly doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna open it up for any questions, uh, can, any questions or comments or anything else. What is this? Uh, X, X, K, C, D. Uh, when users take a photo, the app should check whether it is a national park. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll need to research team in five years. Yeah, exactly, right? Right. It's, it's a classic, but you, you, you solved that problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Um, it's really amazing what you can do on the cloud with uh, some basic tooling. 
and a little bit of like, let's see what I can do. Um, so, and, and it was just fun scaling the problem up, you know, like, uh, I think a lot of times we limit ourselves artificially to this very local solution and not think about like, oh, how can I apply this to a global scale if I wanted to and just see how far we can grow it. Really cool project. Very neat. Do you, are you ever going to, do you have like a plan to post like, uh, you know, a DIY project page that showed like your setup and how you've done things? And I, pro I probably will. Um, I think at the end of this month, I'll post it on my GitHub. So cool. if I go back, yeah, if you go back to the slides, I'll, you can just find me in GitHub. I'll, I have a folder for 2020 code Palooza that I haven't put anything into yet, but I'll put it in there. I use it pretty standard. The bird feeder setup was pretty standard. I found it on a Raspberry Pi magazine. You know, um, the only thing I did really was build a script that made sure to like either send it or save it, you know, locally, depending on Wi-Fi connection or not. Um, and then the the AWS part of it was, I guess it was just kind of like gluing some Lambda stuff together, you know, like send it to this SP bucket, set up a little notification. If Lambda gets a notification of a new file, run run this uh, SageMaker modeling job against it, classify it, stick it in a bucket, update a CSV file. And then I just kind of pointed my Snowflake instance to read from that CSV file periodically and just kind of use that as like a, a database to query query information and then from there, I, mean, I did some. I did like a couple of visualizations uh, with um, what is this thing called? Looker. It's a tool called Looker. I think Google just recently bought them. Just did a really couple of basic stuff where I was able to. Uh, I kind of laid out all of the bird pictures that I had collected, and then when you clicked on it, it showed you like the underlying, you know, information like where, when, uh, what kind of bird it was. And different things. So I'd like to find a way to. I'm thinking the best UI would probably be, probably be like a a map of the world, and like you know, kind of like a Google map where like each dot was a picture of a bird, and you could like zoom in and say, oh, this is where you found the bird, and you know, uh, I don't know, it's kind of cool. Um, my kids, my kids are totally over birds now. They like they care less right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. You know, they're totally over it, totally over this whole bird thing. Um, but it was fun. It was fun. Yeah, sounds sounds very cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. This was uh, a great talk. Very interesting. I kind of want to. I kind of want to do it now. Yeah. Right. I I'll like post. I um, yeah. I'll, I'll at least. I think by the end of the day, I'll post the link to the Raspberry Pi setup that I use because that's like I found it on a Raspberry Pi website. So if you check my GitHub by the end of the day, it'll be in there. And then I will, I think over the week or two, I'll try to look at my code to make sure like somebody else can read it and not just me. <laughs> <Man. laughs> it's not some random like names or whatever. And I'm like, what is this? Uh, Cause you know how you build stuff and then, you know, you come back to it three months later and you're like, I don't know what's going on here. Um, yeah, that so, happens but, every day. Yeah, but I'll post the Raspberry Pi setup if you want to build it. I mean, it's really cool. You could do it for, you could really do it for less than fifty bucks. If you already have a Raspberry Pi, you could do it for less than thirty bucks. Cool, cool. I've always wanted to get into a Raspberry Pi project. I just never, never came up with something where I where I know I'm going to have a satisfying output, and this yeah. would be, this would be satisfying. Data is cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely cool. All right, guys. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great day. And if I don't see you again, be safe. You too, man. Thanks. See you. Bye.